Okay. I think we, we, we were onto something with flying dragons, and then it just went downhill from there. <laughs> you just want to Patron! The Patron account. Patron. <laughs> this, I just, you by have the to way, set up the Patreon By account, the way, please. this would be a great Patreon account, because uh, 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 it baits. I mean, we've got all, we've what? got dragons, we've got three heavens, we've got fall yeah. of Satan, and we could just put little blips out there, and, and then... Um, but we got nothing helpful. Well, that, that's why you take their money. That is right, the we... best intro music in the potosphere, right? There. I think it's good. good. It is I good. So yeah. uh, every, I'm refreshed on that point every time I hear it. It's yeah. great. Um, we can't be messing around with light chit chat and nonsense because we've got a you know daylight's burning, chop chop vibe going on this morning. Uh, because Andre and I, not Nick, because he's a dark hole of despair and unable to take on new <laughs> ideas. Uh, Andre and I have got a Latin class to get to. Ooh. So. And they've just daylight savings has moved that an hour earlier. So now this is, uh, you know, we have to do that at 10. So I had just kind of given up on it. I thought I wasn't going to be doing that anymore. No, 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 you're doing it. You see, and it's partially, <laughs> partially open to new ideas. But uh, you know, I'm, I'm open at least to I have still, I have, is willing, but I don't yeah. give in to peer pressure. Yeah, well, Andrea, I have some big brotherly sway still, it seems, with yeah, Andrea. Yeah. So I'm still, I'm there. still bow. Yeah. Anyway. So, you know, and the other thing I was thinking, it's so nice meeting with you guys in the morning. Couldn't we do this on a Monday morning? That's when I actually need to have this happen. Mm. Is that when that, you mm. need it? Because like, man, Monday morning, I'm spaced out, man. Are, like you, are you really? Slowly coming back to humanity. Yeah, well, that's the point. Like, it's just <laughs> like, you know, you, you're not exactly going to sit here and put out your best work. So You don't yeah. want me to talk on a Monday morning. <laughs> oh, that's true. Touché. I kind of want to hear Touché. it. Now. I do kind of want to hear it. Number one, no, but number one, like I, I don't want to hear my, uh, Nick on a Monday morning. I can testify to that. And then, secondly, I um I don't know that I want to hear it on a Monday morning either. And and uh. and, and number three, I'm actually not sure I'd be talking uh, on a Monday morning. But I was thinking, like, if there was anyone that was going to bring it out of me, it'd be you guys, mm. Chiching. Yeah, Chiching. it would be my Sunday night too. So I'd still be on like the post church high. Oh, yeah, you'd I still be. Would, I think it'd make an guys... interesting dynamic. Just, would, just, just uh, putting yeah. it out there. Yeah, we you might... speak and I will tear you down. <laughs> you speak, I'll tear you down. Oh, because I mean, <laughs> my goodness. So, if anyone's, I mean, if anyone's listening to this and they're, they're, they're pastors and preachers, uh, you know about Monday mornings. Oh, hmm. oh, or oh, Sunday nights too. Brutal. I don't yeah, know. Sunday you... nights also not great. Yeah, Sunday know. nights okay because you kind of still like in relaxed vibes. Still coming like down one little the... moment of like yeah. calm before the, the the storm. Two sermons, bro. I've got two sermons to preach. So you just Andre, you do two as well. Yeah, yeah, kind of. Yeah. 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 And then uh, on the evening, oh, my, my wife's into games. She loves games, so it's like games, games, games. Like everyone, everyone's over for cards. And I'm like, that is unthinkable. Got lie on the like, couch. Why you know, you're you're gonna lay down the law. But I discovered the other day. I'm gonna stop teasing Mark about being a one sermon guy because I discovered that basically every week Mike writes, uh, and his research and writing is more than I do for my entire thesis each week. The copying and pasting doesn't count. No, no. The same. Not copying and pasting. <laughs> we don't want to go down there. No. Yeah, we, we drop, there, it. drop it. Drop it, Nick. Drop it immediately. Because I got some, I got some things I want to say about that. The forbidden episode. You know that I was questioned on that. <laughs> Were you? And, I'm and sure so, you said. Oh, and you got so, did you, did you direct did you tell them, them about the Patreon? The Patreon uh, <laughs> <laughs> See, it's getting traction already. We could do this. We could do this. We could make money. This is going to be amazing. I mean, let's pre- let's play it up. It, it was uh, it was a big episode, and I do have it on my computer. It is still there, so you could find it out there. if you're willing to pay mm-hmm. the money. Yeah. um so yeah i it, it, no, it is it is important i think to to preach a proper sermon in the morning rather than just you know divide the workload into two and and uh pretend that you're you know being productive mm. yeah okay sure nice yeah <laughs> last word <laughs> <laughs> okay okay so now, <laughs> what are we going to talk about? Genesis. I, 
Genesis. Ex- Leviticus. Genesis. And numbers. Jude. Torah. <laughs> hey, it's not Monday morning. It's Wednesday morning. You should be out of the zone. <laughs> <laughs> You've had like two days to get back into it. You're, you, you know. So, all right. Um, you want to talk about Genesis? That kind of fits in with my thing. Uh, what, 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 what is it about? I want, I want to talk about uh, the serpent in Genesis. Oh. What are we doing, the angels? Ooh. Let's start with the serpent. Also cool. What about the giants? The Nephilim and the, the Rephaim. Nephilim. The Nephilim. That's what I'm saying. You got to start with the serpent. Oh, yeah. Start with the serpent. Go. True. We've got to have some kind of system to it. Otherwise, we're just going to be like all over the place. All the but time. isn't, doesn't, when the Bible talks about giants, isn't that just talking about your greatest fears? <laughs> it is. That can only be slain with the five smooth, st- smooth stones of prayer, fasting, <laughs> church, uh, classic Bible memorization. <laughs> I, know, I know I I knew it already, but it's just to hear it again. You know, it's just it never gets old for me. It's great. <laughs> um, so why are we going to Genesis, Sandra? Yeah, why? What's going on? What's the renewed interest? So think if we, okay, so here's here's the first question. I'll, I'll put this out to you. Okay. Oh, traditional before, Christian. before we start, before we start, I, yes. didn't, I was into it, Mike. You can't pull me to the precipice. <laughs> are there, are there no, uh, are there no, I'd already uh, jumped off the bungee thing. I was going, you can't they, say no at that uh, point. Uh, <laughs> but if you keep talking about the bungee jump, the cord, it's like not bungee jumping. Are there, are there no heart issues? <laughs> Anything, um, you know, happening in the Anglicanism? <laughs> oh, yeah. My. Uh, okay. Yeah. I just said There's it. quite a lot going on, <laughs> if you must know. I'm, sh- I'm sure we're, we're uh, ready to go on that one. <laughs> I'm certainly up to date with the news. So, yeah. you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. I've learned my lesson. I'll never bring up current affairs ever again. No. Even, All right. even if you invite me to, I will nah. never do this. No, no. Um, someone actually loved it. Really? That was that was the part they really enjoyed. Okay. Yeah. Well, there we go. There's something for everyone. There wow, that was a very small part. Yeah. They enjoyed a lot. <laughs> they enjoy. <laughs> yeah, that, the rest must have been a real disappointment. <laughs> um, okay, so give it to us. Uh, okay, question. Back, back on the bungee. Go. Okay. Question is... Hey, wait a minute. So, uh, <laughs> no, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, right. where... Okay. Where, where the fall of, of Satan, right? Where is that described in the Bible? So do we think that uh, Genesis 3 provides the earliest account or the account of the fall of Satan? Or do we think there was some pre-Genesis 3 event that uh, may or may not be recorded in the scriptures? You know, the more traditional view, do we think it starts with Genesis 3, Option another option? Isaiah 14, you mean? Yeah, so Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, are they referring back to the garden uh, and the fall of Satan there, or are they referring to something else going on there? Because that's another possibility. And um, Or are we saying that they're referring back to a sort of prehistoric, pre, you know, uh, yeah, prehistoric event <clears throat> of, of some angelic fall that isn't really recorded? Uh, although, I mean, there's all, all kinds of things. Some people think Revelation 12 with the sweeping of the stars is a reference to that event. Some people think Isaiah refers to that event. Ezekiel refers to that event. That's probably the most common mm. understanding, I'd say, that I've come across and also probably in the in the early church. But mm. I don't, um, yeah, I just think that's where the discussion needs to start. So where, where are we? I am. When we're talking about you, the fall. Just I'll bite. Okay, yes. go, go for it. Nice. <laughs> yes. 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 What? So uh, I, I'm probably a proponent of the traditional. I okay. like the traditional. View. According to what tradition? Well, yeah, just the tradition. Oh, <laughs> let the me know about this tradition. great tradition. Mm. <laughs> well, I mean, the I, only one. So, uh, I mean, this was a little bit of my own charismatic thinking thrown in and then confirmed ah, by the, the great, charismatic tradition. The great theologian Wayne Grudem confirmed my thinking. So I think ah, I'm right. Oh, I see. Okay. Well, if Wayne says it. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I remember 
hearing about the fact that you know you know you start off by you know you've got your biblicist approach you've got your you know isaiah 14 is obviously talking about satan and then you hear that challenged when you begin to uh, you know look at grammatical historical exegesis so you're not just doing that that flat topological maximalist sort of reading you know you begin to ancient near eastern stuff and oh mm -hmm. it's probably talking about uh babylon and the king of babylon and so mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. and then you sort of and that but you, you you're unwilling to let go of that and mm -hmm. so you, you always wanted to wrestle against what seems to be a liberal approach mm -hmm. and um i guess just thinking more about daniel and the principalities and the powers uh, the, the, the way that i was trying to harmonize being true to what the bible is probably saying it seemed to be saying about satan and yet recognizing there's a definite human element going on there mm -hmm. is um that is god addressing the principality and power through the earthly vessel through the earthly puppet that, that the devil is presently employing mm. so at that time the babylonians would have been the major puppet the devil would have been seeking to use to disrupt life in the middle eastern world to get at the seed of the woman yes and so so god is addressing the principality and power through the earthly king yeah um yeah and then then i read it grudem and thought he's also right <laughs> um and so that's where that's presently where i stand awesome yeah no well i mean that's because that happens often you know with and that's sort of our mm. approach with most things in the old testament in that it's it's not void of a historical situation yeah. in that it, you know that that becomes the launch pad to thinking about a theology a prophetic piece that comes off of that um that is only obviously accessible via this prophetic re revelation that but but it always has this idiom associated to it, it always has this focal point so uh you know a, as you were saying there that in that case that the king becomes this kind of idiom for everything that satan is and and i think the only reason people have ever thought that it's saying more than what one could say about that king is just because the language just goes way beyond it you know yeah uh, you sort of start there and 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 you think okay well yeah this, this guy could be you know in view but then all of a sudden you're talking about eden and you know all these things and and uh and you have to sort of uh think it through carefully so yeah that's i'd say that's pretty much my approach as well what, what what's your thinking andrew well i think i'm i'm starting to i mean that's been um, I, I don't, it's not so much that I disagree with any of the kind of exegetical steps you've taken. It's just that um, I think I, I have, it was, it was interesting because on my, on my own, just, just from my own kind of reflection on Genesis, I preached through Genesis 1 to 3 a little while ago, and I didn't cover this, but um, I, I think I may have alluded to it, but I, I was starting to grow in a suspicion that Genesis 3 may be describing the fall of satan okay so that was yes, your hardest boss is with you brother mm. yeah I, I i realize it's not a novel view um but it's not so much a view i, I gained from reading another theologian it was just is just thinking about the the narrative of it and i didn't have any firm conclusions just more of a hunch right and then reading heiser and i, I won't say that he takes exactly that view because um i'm still not entirely sure yeah whether Haza actually thinks the serpent is Satan. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't really know. Anyway, yeah. so he, um, but, but he certainly would say that that is the first fall of some supernatural being. And, and that kind of, and I think there, there were good reasons behind that. So that's kind of, I think, made me uh, lean less away from the more traditional that there was a pre-creation event. Um, not saying that that's impossible, but it, I, it's a couple of things made sense to me. Okay. Mm. So the, the first is that, well, um, yeah. like, okay. So, so the one view is that Adam and Eve were in the garden, the serpent comes in and he's either like a literal serpent that is like possessed by the devil. or Satan is in the form of a serpent or the serpent is symbolic language for this being. And the serpent the is not like everyone agrees the serpent's not on its belly yet sliding around. So whatever it looked like is not that. Yeah. It's yeah. not a it's not a standard, you know, dragon. So, dragon. Slung. so it could be like a dragon with wings, like literally. Who knows? You know? Yeah. Well, yeah. I think I, that's I think more in, the imagery. In so. fact, I think Gil, uh man, I remember just Dinosaur. As, Dinosaur. as I'm speaking right now, I'm remembering I'm remembering <clears> that uh Gil had I think it was Gil, some one of those old guys had this crazy like description of what it obviously must be you yeah. know <laughs> if we deduce I x y that. and z and uh Dude, we've and, got to find that i know i've got to find it i'll get it 
maybe I can go and find it right now, actually. But yeah, go for it. Keep talking. No, I, so so look, you, you've either got one or two options that that Adam Adam was deceived. Adam and Eve were deceived because you know they're expected to find this kind of serpenty creature. Um, they just didn't realize that uh, you know it was it was Satan deceiving them through this creature at first, and that's and that's what allowed them to buy into it. Um, problem with that is it, it gives rise to other questions. Like, would, did all the animals talk at that point? Like, you yes. know, it, it is are we, are we? Is that what is implied by that notion? And therefore, that's why they weren't surprised to have a talking serpent. So yeah. Disney or, is an it, anticipation of the new creation. Is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah. Well, Joking. it could be. I mean, I'm just saying that if you if you were into, <laughs> if you're trying to make sense of the details, yeah. then you might be thinking, okay, well, animals are going to talk in the new creation as well. If new creation right. is, you know, but I'm just saying, like that's one way you have to go with it. Okay. But the other, I, I the don't other think option, they do. I don't think they did. You don't think what, the animals, animals were talking? No. You think it was a telepathy thing? I don't think animals. No, wait. I, well, 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 I know what you believe. I know what you believe. I know what you believe. Karen. It was all an allegory. I don't believe that. For for like, so we're interrupting in Andre. Let's let Andre get back on track. No, no, no. You're the one that opened this category. <laughs> I, I want to know what what do you believe about talking animals? I don't believe that all the animals in Eden were talking. Okay. What were they doing then? They obviously had some sort no, of Mark, conversation. Mark, 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 Mark. Hang on, hang on. So okay. picking up on that, then. Yes. Why weren't Adam and Eve like immediately on guard to have an animal talking to them? Exactly, because that would freak me out. Do you have okay. an yeah, So the most people would be, would be out. like, oh, you're not like the other ones. Yeah. yeah. Like, my, my, my rational point comes from <clears throat> we're made in the image of God and animals are not. And so I'm making that distinction and assuming sure. that language is part of that. <clears throat> well, well, I think I think that while it's obviously we can't be, you know, super prescriptive about it, but it does have a logic. I I, I agree. I think there's a yeah. the, there Jesus is a distinction. Jesus is the word. We are made in his image. Yeah. Language is fundamental. Yeah. So it's like busting my dream of having a conversation with my pet when I get to heaven. <laughs> Bones, bro. Bones ain't gonna be I know it's gonna be wagging his tail. Finding yeah. out about everything. No, all right, go. <laughs> okay. So that that's a, that's a, a bit of a you know, it's a little bit like the Kleinian cool of the day thing. Like there's just something about the narrative that doesn't yeah. make sense. If yeah. you're if you're saying God is just strolling <laughs> through the garden. Uh, you know, in the cool of the day, and mm. he's just like, "Oh, Adam, Eve, yeah. where are you?" You know, and there's this massive problem that everybody knows about except for God. It just yeah. doesn't it it doesn't make sense. So the cool of the day as actually God coming in judgment, yeah, um, makes a lot more sense. So when I heard about that, I was like, "Ah, oh, you know, piece of the puzzle goes in." That that definitely helps. And I'm thinking, if you're thinking that uh, here's this talking serpent that is unique among the animals he's talking and Adam and Eve aren't, aren't starting a twig. I just think that doesn't quite flow. A better alternative is that that animal, that talking animal, that talking serpent, um, whether that's symbolic or literal, is meant to be there. And Adam and Eve knew that being because that being was doing what that being does. And what deceived them was not that the being was talking, but what the being was saying. And how it twisted and distorted God's word, and I think that makes a lot more sense mm, like at, at one level. That's one. That's one point. <clears throat> okay, so what was the being? Well, I I, th I, I think the being is is uh, it, so I, I'm I'm totally persuaded again by the the Kleinian thing, uh, the, not the Kleinian thing, the Haza thing that it's um, it's a cherub, a seraph. Sorry, yeah. a seraph. A, okay, a, a, but like a throne to... guardian in the garden temple throne room that is Eden. And so possessing a serpent or nothing to do with a serpent? No, a serpent's pure symbol. Okay, that's what I was looking for. So uh, an now, actual I serpent that we this. see today yes. uh, has absolutely nothing to do with what's being spoken of there, aside from the uh, No, No, I think it's a play on words because okay. the serpent, the serpent seraph uh, uh, or... or um, the 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 seraph yeah. and the serpent and the the nachash they nahash. all it's a play on words that all all have connotations that go around the idea of this being who guards the throne of God and is shining or fiery in its appearance. So uh, um, I think that's okay. it's it's I mean that's 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 based on a wordplay, but I guess here's here's uh, I'm not happy with it. Here's my reason. 
-hmm. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field mm -hmm. that the Lord God had made. Yeah. So there yeah, we there right. we have the domain yeah. Yeah. of 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 the serpent, um, which is not heavenly. So unless there's some nuance which is not being translated, which maybe in the garden, you know, whereas uh, part of the uh, the temple furniture, the angelic temple furniture of the of a particular garden scene, but that doesn't seem to be the language. Um, well, so yeah, maybe I should, maybe I should clarify that, that when I'm talking, and that's a fair point. I mean, I think that is, um, and it's something that Heiser doesn't doesn't address. So I, I think, but but when it's you know when the Bible uses symbolism. It's not to say that there isn't something literal being described as well. It's just that the symbol is at the forefront. And I guess that's that's the point that I'm making. So I'm I'm less worried about what kind of animal it was and more concerned with what that is representing. Well, I've heard it yeah. um I've heard it put forward that, you know, it wouldn't it wouldn't have been unusual for whatever sort of angelic being is involved there, you know, to inhabit the body of whatever animal you know, and, and that would be kind of a normal thing. So in that case, that would be, you know, it would take care yeah. of both. Or well, how about this? I mean, because what we're relying on is the psychological impact of the novelty, which is either there or not there. So couldn't we interpret it, you know, in the other direction? They were so amazed that a serpent was speaking that they paid heed to its words and immediately got over the fact that the serpent was speaking as they listened to its words. Um, so... It, yeah, it, it, it's a fair point. Yeah. It's just that I'm not relying so purely on the on the um, the psychological thing. It's more just in terms of flow of narrative. That's the point I was making. So there's a point. But uh, but there's also the parallels with other ancient Near Eastern creation myths where you have very similar sorts of figures represented in very similar sorts of circumstances. So a couple of key points would be... Um, the the role that serpent like beings played as throne guardians in the divine temples you know in in these temple gardens and so um the fact that you have a serpent who is in the in the the eden which is the divine throne room of god's cosmic temple um does seem to have an immediate parallel there but it's also in those ancient near eastern creation accounts they are describing the basically the downfall of some being. There's, you know, in their versions, there's a cosmic battle, and then that being gets thrown down. And obviously, there are there uh, there are discontinuities between that and the biblical story because there isn't the dualism or whatever. But it is also describing the origin of the source of evil, you know, which either leads to being the creation of the world or or something like that. And I just well, think that has to be a factor. Let me interject with something else because um, I remember sitting in. Uh, I want to respond uh... to that, but yeah, carry on. Okay, go for it. No, you do that first. I'm gonna do <laughs> well, but I guess, I guess. So here's my here are my biblicistic roots and my hackles rising. So, you know, just just sort of leaning a lot more strongly into the notion of the sufficiency of scripture. And do we need all of the information of the in ancient Near Eastern context to make this intelligible, or is the Word of God intelligible to us without that immediate context? Because if that context enriches our and deepens our understanding, fine. But is this an understanding that could is it, have without? Is it that? hypothesis suggestive or not? <laughs> I think is what you're asking. Well, yeah. So that again is a is a fair is a fair point and a fair critique. But I think at the very least, what it'll do is warn us of being warn us against being overly literal. So I think I think you know, I, don't, it's I, don't, not, I don't have a problem with that. No, but th but this is my point. So I think we we tend to I think be. You, do. you have a little bit of a problem with that. <laughs> a tiny no little problem. problem. It's not a big problem yeah, here. Today. We have to keep it under control. I think these things are helpful to say yeah. to us, hang on a sec, you don't know as much as you think that you do. So, so you. here comes 21st century biblicist, fundamentalist Christian, yeah. reads his Bible, thinks he knows precisely what's going on. And actually, if he did pay attention to all the themes connecting the dots all the way through scripture, he might change his view. Yeah, These I think things are just ways of helping us see those connections. It's all about taking the Bible seriously. Uh, I think uh, you know, and and the words of the Bible seriously. And and to take something literally is not to take it seriously, because yeah. you know, something when when a genre not necessarily no, yeah, when a genre, on the genre, of, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, to take a poet a poetic piece literally is to really do it. 
great harm, you know, and to not take it seriously. So we're not saying that uh, Genesis is poetry, but, you know, every text has its sort of way of being interpreted and you got to interpret it in context and so forth. <clears throat> so I think that, um, that, you know, all of this must, must, you know, Bonson against Klein kept on saying, you know, he brings in all these ancient Near Eastern things because, you know, we have to allow the text to stand on its own without all these elements that are um, hypothesis suggestive. And, um, and, uh, and I think, you know, as far as Bonson was going, I think he was making a good point in, in that that's true. You can't, because, you know, we know these guys, right? We know these ancient Near Eastern guys and they, they just have a field day and they, the text becomes, you know, something that just falls away into the background yeah. and, and their, their new insights are what rules the day. But at the same time, it's like we are equally, you know, to lean on our own current worldview and, and insights it's just we're doing the same thing in the opposite direction and and we're disguising it in being literal and so yeah. that's that's the danger so you have to i think what it does do at very minimum is it gets you to ask questions you never thought to ask it gets you to see things you never even dreamed uh, dreamed of, of paying attention to but they're all there and you have to have a look at them and you can see that it might mean you have to take the text more seriously even if, if it's not entirely yeah. as literal as what and, 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 and at a very fundamental level I mean, you've got the rest of scripture referring to Satan as that great serpent. Yeah. You know, and then and then they're not referring and, to and it's not literally yeah. A, yeah. a beast of the field there. And so there's something, there's something that happens in the scope of the biblical narrative that expands that view. It's yeah, just I mean, we all know how I mean, far like, you can it, read it that wasn't back. a serpent in view. I mean, that's like the plainest thing in the world. Like everyone knows that you know it's not a yeah. serpent, it was Satan, you know. Uh, even if we haven't connected the, the dots to Hasatan and the, the serpent and all that, and uh, you know, I don't know. For me, I have enough to go on there just to go, you know what, that was obviously Satan at work. Yeah. And and it's yet we're dealing mm -hmm. with the snake, you know, and it's so there's you know, there is a thing going on. But you know, just bringing it back to this issue of of just just so if someone's listening into this um uh, what do you i mean uh, you might want to frame it in terms of what what heiser says or uh what you're actually suggesting here that because where we're saying more traditionally you're thinking of a fall that happened way beyond the, uh, way wow. before this point prior even maybe to the creation of the world uh just in that invisible angelic realm uh <clears throat> you're saying no actually everything was hunky dory and then this is the moment so it's not like satan had the, i don't know this is the story i heard that, uh, you know, Satan was the most beautiful of all the angels and, uh, and, you know, he was probably the most powerful and yet it wasn't enough for him. So somewhere back in the day, you know, there was this full on, um, you know, he, he decided to reach for the, the throne and, and uh, was cast out and so had been lurking and somehow miraculously made himself disguised you know into the garden he, he sort of came, got into the garden through the use of the yeah, serpent snuck in somehow yeah, yeah. well yeah. that's here's where the serpent comes in you know he used the serpent to do it and um and of course god knew that that would happen but that became a test for for uh for um adam and he failed the test and so forth okay so now what, what are you saying that's different to that just just to be clear and then we can go from there um <clears throat> So I, I so I I think I'm increasingly persuaded that rather than trying to find in Scripture some obscure references to an event prior to Genesis three that describes Satan's fall, so a non-recorded event, um, I, I think that the later descriptions of Satan's fall are pointing back to Genesis three as the fall of Satan. Mm -hmm. So I think that what's going on in the garden is not that Satan already fallen infiltrates the garden yes. yeah. and tricks Adam and Eve. It's that um, a being, a throne guardian who belonged there mm, mm. Um, betrayed Adam and Eve by, by deceiving him. Mm. And I think there are reasons for that. So again, one of the, one of the big mysteries about Satan is, is that clear to answer your question? Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So I just, guess so, so I, I just wanted to come in and ask, are they mutually exclusive? So, for example, like, let me just go to the text, uh, Isaiah 14, verse 12 and following. It says, how you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. So instead of taking that as the, you know, envisaging the battle scene in heaven, God overcomes Satan and throws him down to the earth. And while God's cleaning up the mess in heaven, Satan runs into the garden and starts doing stuff. Instead of seeing that as a chronological description of first a fall from heaven and then a penetration of the garden. Couldn't it be a case of, because I think verse 13 for me seems to suggest Eden. put it all in the, yeah. no, well, verse 13 puts it all in the internal world of Satan. You've said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. So, so all of the, all of the rebellion 
could be going on in the heart of Satan while he's tempting in the garden. Not there doesn't need to be a previous battle, yeah, and yeah. fall before some sort of. Uh, so so it's all all of what drove him to do the tempting in the garden part is all of all of the internal stuff that's being described in Isaiah fourteen. Mm -hmm. So thank you. I'm I'm not saying that Isaiah fourteen and Ezekiel twenty eight aren't a reference to Satan. Yeah, I just yeah. I'm just saying that they're not a reference to a pre Edenic fall. Okay, and also just in case that was like a thing. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree that that can be completely, you know, that can work with everything you're saying. But it also, you know, is the case that a lot of that can be, um, you know, a lot of people think that that's talking about Adam, not Satan, uh, to begin with. You know, yes. So, now that and that's a worthy point. So Bill is hot on this. He, but if yes. you go to King James, doesn't it say Lucifer here? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> and the Vulgate, um, isn't it? Isn't that where the isn't it, the Vulgate? Um, that's where it comes but, from. That's yeah, why but, yeah, true, 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 true. Yeah, um, but but yeah. So, anyways, I mean that that text can work in both ways, and you you know, so it's not going to be the definitive thing that you fall back on. Is what I'm saying. You you could you could apply that to Satan. It might even have this dual application. There's all of that as well. But anyway, um, uh, the other thing though, uh, just coming back to your view then, or, or just you know what you're suggesting, and you know the what, the reason I have liked it and have felt like. You know, it makes sense of a few things, which I think uh, you're picking up on there. But here's, a, here's an angle that I don't think um, I had considered until quite recently. And it just sort of hit me between the eyes. But um, I was sitting in on a class and uh, it was a Roman Catholic teacher. And uh, and he was he was saying that, um, you know, we were just we were just sort of casually talking about the the fall. And uh, and he was like, wait a minute you know people talk about the fall as you know as happening there with adam and you know that's clearly not the case that's not the fall oh the fall of the creation was not adam and eve fall took place way before that so and that brought into question the goodness of the creation and all of that mm -hmm. because and so the you know he was just seeing plain as daylight what actually we all should have kind of been in on <laughs> you know if we're going to suggest that prior to the creation god made the heavens and the earth um and then there's this sort of you know if you take a Kleinian approach on that visible and invisible going on there everything created in other words and then it fell. an approach yeah yeah and, and uh and then it's uh it you know it fell way before adam and eve we're going to go go into this whole yeah, pre yeah, pre-fall yeah. narrative yeah. and then you know all we're seeing is the fall of man you know, and but it's already a fallen creation in some sense because you've got yeah. the whole the whole of heaven running amok. And I know we knew that already, but it's kind of like a like, I don't know if I I don't think that's right. You know, I, I feel like it just doesn't feel like it makes sense. Um, it feels yeah. like what happened with with Adam there and Satan is what happened. Uh, yeah. You know, that was was God was um, Satan trying to usurp the throne and use man to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you just have to say, well, if. I, I, so again, yeah, the the skeptic might say, okay, well, let's just assume there was this pre-Edenic fall of Satan, as is the the, the traditional view. You know, sometime after Genesis one one, you know, it, it, somewhere around there. Mm. Um, uh, let's just let's just say that 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 was the case. Um, totally lost my train of thought now. Gosh, what the heck? it's just well, gone it is his evening we're, we're fresh yeah that is crazy it's totally <laughs> disappeared <laughs> old age bro hang on what were you saying what were you saying go back all right the pre the pre, <laughs> the pre <laughs> oh yeah oh dear. god i've lost it <laughs> okay, okay i got it well, got what it. about the giants Oh, no, no, we can't go there. No, whoa, 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 not, whoa, whoa. not yet no we're gonna give you what i what i what i was gonna say is um, the skeptic might look at that, that whole thing and say, if we're saying that that really is the kind of entrance of evil into the world, that's a fairly big piece of the puzzle, like the, the origin of evil. And we're saying that there isn't actually any clear biblical reference to that. Mm. You know, so I think, I think arguably you could say that Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 20 are references to the garden. And if not Satan, then Adam. Okay. And then if you... If you're taking that view, you've you've got some at best very cryptic allusions, and we're talking about two verses in the whole Bible to deal with what is probably one of the biggest pieces in the puzzle. If we're saying that that Christ 
is the fulfillment of you know the serpent crusher prom promise then really he is solving the problem that is set up for us in Genesis. And if we're saying that we don't actually know, the Bible doesn't even talk to us about um, where the origin of that comes from. I just think a skeptic might look at that and think that's a fairly big piece of the puzzle to just not even attempt to talk about. Whereas if you see it as Genesis 3 being the, des the description of Satan's fall, that is actually providing for us that piece of the puzzle. It's saying, here is the origin of evil. Here is where it all happened. And I think it also helps us to understand motive. Because one of the big mysteries of this is, well, if Satan was this glorious creature in the heavens, at, and he was so close to God, who is the holy of holies, how on earth would he just suddenly decide to rebel against God? You know, if it's some pre-Edenic event, there's there's no way for us to know, like, what happened? Did God, like, uh, was God just a bit short with him one day and Satan had had enough? Like, you know, yeah, you end up... I like Lester Sumrall's take on that. Remember Lester Sumrall? No. So what, what was going on in the heart of Satan when he hmm. fell? So and he, he starts with Hebrews 1.14 because angels have been made ministers to the yep. heirs of salvation. He basically yep. says that uh, it was jealousy. jealousy he, yep. he, who was so beautiful, didn't didn't like the idea of being a servant. Mm. And so he That's decided exactly he decided to scuttle the process and uh, try and provoke God to judge his own creation. So wouldn't it therefore make sense that that took place off just yeah, after the creation of man just, in the biblical story? Just, just when the divine council has been summoned, let's make yeah. man in our image. Yeah, uh, no, and he's thinking, I'm, and they're like, I'm, ha I'm happy with a both-and approach. You know, as, as long as we're not using all this Near Eastern stuff to completely dislodge um, some of the traditional aspects of our interpretation, I'm happy. Yeah, but the King James Version... Well, I don't know, to be fair, I, I, I mean, I, I, I'm not saying we, we go to the stake on it, but I am yeah. saying that, I, I don't. I mean, I don't think you can harmonize them totally. I think there's a lot of crossover and a lot of the traditional descriptions of Satan's motivation and all that still fits, but you either see Satan's fall as an event in the garden so, or you see it before that. And, uh, and when it all, ever in doubt, always go to John Gill because... He was the big A and E guy before A and E. Yeah. I mean, he was like he was like a full heart before cool. scholar. He had read he had literally read all the classics, all the fathers, all the Hebrew guys, all the Talmud, all the you know just everything. He read it all, and so he brings it all into his commentary. So you often get some really interesting texts. Now, obviously, scholarship has been updated, but anyways, it's always worth checking John Gill on this because he's also got this like really robust Reformed Baptist framework going on. Uh, so it's 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 just often I found wow that's so insightful. But for example, um, and he said to the woman, he's commenting on that talking about Satan speaking to the woman, um, being alone, which he took the advantage of, not the serpent, but Satan in it. Which uh, so he's saying, you know, the Satan in in um, in dwelt him. Uh, for we are not to imagine with Philo Josephus. Aben Ezra and others that beasts in their original state had the faculty of speech. That's one for Nick. Well done, Nick, you know, uh, whose yeah. language uh, Eve understood. It is very probable that good angels appeared in paradise to our first parents in one form or another and conversed with them. It may be in a human form. It may be in the form of a beautiful flying serpent. There we go. Which, <laughs> which Whoa, looked, wings. which check it out, which looked very bright and shining and the sort called seraph. Mm. John Gill, bro. He's just there before anyone that's, else. That's crazy, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah, so very I, interesting. I, I think it's increasingly persuasive to me just because so many pieces of the puzzle just start to make a lot more sense. That's that's all. Um, yeah, I'm not. And the only I'm not, I would I would tread lightly on the fact that uh, angels appear in, in beastly form um, as as a common, you know. I would, I would tread very it's, uh, it I'd sounds very it talking esque doesn't it well it's it's i mean i don't mind you know if you're trying to base it on the word seraph and trying to move it towards seraphim and you know you're trying to find the language link and trying to build it that way but as long as it's left as extremely tentative and not uh the exact reconstruction mm. because i i can i can find alternative explanations with with equal you know that make it equally intelligible well for me i that does it fits the bill because i mean basically that 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 does take everything Andrew was saying earlier into account in that you've got you do have I mean, maybe a slightly modified form of that in that you have seraph in in the garden anyway that you have some sort of guardian creature there which seems not at all weird toward the end of the narrative anyway with the flying uh, with the uh, with the sword and the flaming uh, you know protection there and all that um 
but uh the whole for me it's just like i don't know be intoler intolerably weird it's almost like we're supposed to we're supposed to just supposed to be something of a no-brainer like like yes obviously it's not the serpent speaking you know uh yeah. you know it's like everyone knows that serpents don't speak you know well what you have here uh, though is something that adam and eve were totally accustomed to because she did not say whoa you know how is it that thou speaketh you know and uh and that's not the point of the narrative it's a little yeah. bit like yeah. when but when the, god the, comes the narratives are very abbreviated so i know they, but they, it's a little bit like everything it's like when when God comes in the garden and all of a sudden they're worried. I mean, this is God arriving in a, a theophonic storm cloud of judgment, and they're worried about being naked. You know, at, at that level, you you've got to you got to piece together. Wait a minute, this is more than just like being naked. This is something. Yeah. This is like unable to screen yeah. myself against the the wrath of God uh, because of breaking yeah. the covenant naked. Um, yeah. So again, I think you're supposed to just kind of see these things as you read it. Yeah, well, I get. I mean, I could, I could argue that's probably anachronistic that we expect the important elements to be spelled out in the narrative as we would in a modern storytelling style. No, I no, I, that's, that's no, necessary. no, that's not what I'm saying. Uh, so, I, sorry, yeah, yeah. Now, what I'm saying is um, that you know, it's actually exactly the opposite. You start reading it in Genesis, and you go, "Well, I have no idea what, what's going on." But yeah. then, by the time you get to Revelation. You know, the pieces do fit together to the point that as you go back and reflect on that, it's almost like the point of Hebrew literature sometimes is to get you to be puzzled on exactly the right points so that your brain's kind of open to hear the rest of the story and piece together what needs to come on those points. So it's like, uh, obviously, you've got like talking serpent is the big question mark there, but then that's what gets filled out. You know, that's the thing that that ultimately kind of leads your way. So, I mean, does, you does, does that mean that we that we don't leave it tentative and we can be certain that that's exactly what happened are we are we are we arguing for one construction on this no what what i would be arguing for is that to, to talk about the serpent as a snake or something like that is to miss is to miss the point you know like that's not yeah i would i would leave it as like well i don't i don't understand everything that's going on here no uh, no no there's there's, there's i would serpent, say there's serpent talking that's not normal and we don't know what yeah. impact that had on this on, on the psyche of adam and eve that's not commented on but the devil's obviously that, using this and that's clear from other verses yeah and, and I, I th it's just that that there is some high degree of symbolism happening mm. um it, it is a certainty you know that and that we need to again shrug off our modern evangelical assumptions that if it is symbolic it's not talking about something that actually happened you know like th that's not the, the the biblical symbolism especially in the early chapters just doesn't work that way so you know it, it can be a highly symbolic rendering of something that really did take place and maybe is you know um it, it it's like the the biblical numbers just because the numbers are symbolic doesn't necessarily mean it didn't happen over certain numbers so i'm just studying to samuel uh, for Sunday, and there were seven um, of Saul's sons given over to the Gibeonites uh, for execution, and there might have actually been seven, but also seven is a symbolic yeah. number that represents the whole of Saul's household. So, it, you know, there's, there's, I, I just think we mustn't get get hung up on the. Similarly to when you when you have a frustrating discussion about Genesis and six day creationism, it's just being careful not to get hung up on the wrong details um so the, there is a huge amount of symbolism behind the the days of creation and to and that symbolism must be at the forefront whether or not you think it was six literal days the symbolism is at the forefront yeah. and so the symbolism uh, th is possible through the literal but um I, yes. I, yeah. I mean i do have one point of it's a question that i'm raising because as i read when i read that first verse in chapter three now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field. That's that seems to be post comment analysis. That's post post event analysis. Mm -hmm. The serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field. That's that's a that's a judgment call uh, based on patterns of behavior and character. Mm -hmm. That that seems to be intruding as an anachronistic comment. Um, you know, by the by the person recording the event. Um, so you know there's there's all of those sorts of artifacts and i mean there's the other one would be um uh therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast his wife so so that's the end of genesis chapter two fathers and mothers didn't exist yet but there's the, there's that 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 analytical application already being made by yeah. by moses who's writing that chapter yeah um, so so there are those elements which 
So what do you say? Yeah, about although that? I think no, nothing about that. Those are just way. those those are just yeah. shaking me loose from the fact that we've got a, I guess a, an eyewitness account. There's 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 also other other things coming in at the text there. I don't All think right. it compromises anything we're saying. I'm just no, saying no, it's no, yeah, no. It's, it's, it's fair. I mean, it's really important because a lot of people yeah. read Genesis one as if Moses was there observing it and recording exactly what happened, mm. but it's obviously prophetic, you know. Because obviously yeah, I don't, I, I don't mind if he was on the, the. I like the view where it says he was on the mountain for forty days, and that's when God played the video of Showed Genesis. The, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. Well, you know, that'd be cool. <laughs> but well, also, could have just been taking the oral account and uh, you know working it through. Yeah, that could happen. But another important piece of the symbolism, though, is the cast down to earth. So, you know, that language of being cast down is used explicit, explicit, and the serpent language is being used explicitly of Satan in Revelation 12, for example. Yeah. You know, so in, in Revelation 12, you got two casting downs to yeah. to the earth, mm. and um, and again, I think that's just that's just clearly in Revelation 12. It doesn't mean a snake who loses its legs and is eating dust as it crawls along the ground, right? So clearly that is not what's going on there. And again, I think, like Mike was saying, that is helping us to understand the picture of what happened in Genesis chapter 3, I think. And that casting down is for language. It's saying you are now cast down to, in in a sense, the the visible creation. Although... Um, See, that, yeah, that's but, where it gets confusing for me because, uh, you know, casting down... Does that mean casting into, because I mean, we've sort of divided this thing into a kind of visible and invisible sense, right, uh, of creation. And uh, heaven is really within that visible, uh, invisible sense. Okay. And, um, and so when, when you're, when you're cast down, does that mean just like, you're changing dimensions from visible to, uh, or from invisible to visible? Uh, is that what that means? And if that is the case, when does that actually happen? Does that happen? Uh, does that happen at the fall? Does that happen, you know, when Jesus speaks about it, when, uh, when he, at, the, at the cross, yeah. you know, because there's a lot to suggest. I mean, you've got like, it, it seems Satan is still coming before God around the time of Job. And it's yeah. um, yeah. so that actually he's not cast down until the cross. Um, and, you know, there's all that kind of stuff that you have to play with as well. Yeah, but I guess, I mean, there's third heaven and second heaven. Could it be cast down from third to second? Nice. Well, I, I actually think nice. I, I actually think I, I withdraw. I don't think actually cast down from the invisible realm to the visible realm. You mean is, transported? Is it, transported? Is it? Well, I just don't think that, that, realm. that's the right casting down. So well, I think the, that, the angels are cast down, humans are cast out. Well, uh, no, well, I, I I wonder if I wonder if Satan's casting was also out of out of the throne room in, in Genesis yes, three. But, yes, yes, yes. But the so he's still coming and going. Um, yes, yeah, so before the, the casting down council. in Genesis 12. Here's my take. Uh, I don't think it's unique to me, but my understanding is Revelation that, 12. Re, sorry, Reve, Revelation 12. When the when when yeah. when God's law court is closed because it is finished, mm -hmm. that there is no longer a place for accusation. So the, the accuser of the brethren no no longer has a redemptive position from which to argue from because the the, the work of Christ has now become finished. Mm. So he can't even bring an accusation. Who can condemn where it is God who is justified? So the, the, the doors of the court are shut and the devil, the, the, the accusing uh, attorney, has been cast out. Um, yeah. And so there's, there's, there's that, that finalized lack of approach. So, so, he, yeah. so, you know, that picture in Zechariah 3 where, you know, you've got jo poor old Joshua who's yeah. sitting there in yeah. dirty clothes and there's yeah. Satan coming to accuse you. That can't happen to a Christian because the doors are closed. So, so it's, we it's, say, it's, it's, it's a nice so that, metaphor that you can use to all those sermon maybe, illustrations. All those sermon illustrations are wrong. So, oh, so it's, that's it's so a extreme, nice, Nick. It's, that's so it's, extreme. It's a nice piece of imag imaginary fiction that you can use to demonstrate the truth of justification, but it's not wow. a real life scenario. Wow. 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 Double Wait, wow. I, I'm confused. So, are you saying Revelation 12 is the casting of Satan out yes. of the divine council? Yes. And when did that happen? Yeah. Historically, that happened at the ascension. It, yeah, well, the, from the ascension. incarnation. Yeah, as a result of Christ's finished work. So Christ yeah, ascended yeah. into heaven. So Revelation 12 speaks about the child who goes up. The, you know, there's yeah. that very quick mention of the ascension. But yeah, that, that, as just, a result just, of his, his entering uh, in, at, to the right hand, you know, being coronated at the right hand of God and all of the heavenly session beginning, as a result of the beginning of that heavenly session, the 
the doors of Satan's ability to accuse the brethren is shut. Yeah. And uh, that's yeah, one of the major right. themes of the book of Revelation. So the, the first casting down, Satan still had access to... Yeah. So Zechariah 3 gives counts. us Job, Job 1 and 2, Zechariah 3, give us this uh, different activity pre-Christ than post-Christ. Yeah. yeah. But it is also just interesting to note that the semantic range of cast down to the earth does include the the kind of invisible elements of creation as well. So it does include the idea of Sheol, which is in the earth. And, uh, and you know, again, not literally. So I, I've met many a Christian who feel that hell or Sheol is, is literally inside the earth somewhere. But again, I think that's a symbolic reference to going under. So you, uh, as Ahaza uses the illustration of you bury your dead in the earth. And so that's where the dead go. It's kind of that idea, mm. but it's not it's, necessarily. It's a little literal. bit like um, when Jesus ascends, you know, he's not going up and up and up past, you know, Jupiter and, yeah. and keeps going. So you finally get to heaven. It's more like it's this going upward into a realm that is above our realm and you have an upward movement. Yeah. I and mean, mm. this whole third, second heaven thing, dude, what on earth? What rabbi do you have access to that we don't? Paul. Paul. Okay, but what I know. Whether in of the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. I know, but who explains, what, who told you what Paul meant is what I'm asking. <laughs> he calls it paradise. And while we're at it, can we just deal with baptism of the dead? <laughs> well, Paul calls the third heaven paradise. Okay. Um, you see, yeah, yeah. And, and, yeah, and, yeah so... and Satan is cast down. We are cast out. Yeah, no, uh, you would have to have something like that because obviously we can't we can't see Satan right now, you know, and yeah. and uh, you know there there is um there is something you know it's still obviously invisible. So you would need you would need what I like about that idea though is it kind of gives you the necessity for a three heavenly sort of structure uh, or or a, or a, a two <laughs> or the prince of the power yeah. of the air. Yeah. You know? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, so it does. But I see uh, what it also puts into perspective as you know the kind of myth about satan ruling in hell you know? yes um oh yeah okay yes. so actually there is a there it's wrong so satan it doesn't rule in the place of the you know the the fire of medieval damnation. Uh, yeah but no but you see here's it's all about translations yes. so if if something gets translated hades hell right mm -hmm. um so from greek to latin or whatever mm -hmm. then that's where the misunderstanding comes in but the idea of sheol or hades as being a place where satan rules not ultimately god rules everywhere always obviously but mm -hmm. as in like say that's where he is roaming and doing his thing that's where mm -hmm. he is the god of the earth god of mm -hmm. the age um that that has some truth to it because that's where satan has been cast down to so that is his domain now and I think yeah. that you should that puts that into perspective. Well, Where in the sense, his do, he has some domain over death because Christ hasn't consummated his victory in that area yet, because the last uh, enemy to be overcome is death. So in that, it's it's part of his domain in the sense that he's he's still allowed to play and to bring about certain results. Uh, I mean, he is sin, described but, as the guy. I don't think well. he's personally sitting there with a pitchfork and, you know, pointing, you know, sending demons out. He has a kingdom places. and yeah. the seat of his kingdom is in this. Um, yeah, it's not supernatural in realm. that higher realm, whatever we've just been talking about. Third heaven, yeah, yeah, there is. It's not the third heaven. <laughs> I just, just you pick me. up any Bible dictionary, any it's Bible got, dictionary. Yeah. And it yeah. will outline it very clearly that the, you know, in the medieval times you had, uh, rabbis elaborating on the numbers of heavens and that kind of thing but mm -hmm. but the traditional jewish view um is that you have the first heavens which is which is yes. visible it's the mm -hmm. sky right yes you have the the second heavens mm -hmm. which is the which is what? planets and the oh, okay. and the so space and the things yeah, yeah and then you have the third heavens which is the the supernatural realm okay which is the divine oh, okay. council. Yeah, 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 totally. So at third, yeah, yeah, no, there's no problem with that. So what Paul is basically is, is saying heaven, basically. is that he was taken into the supernatural realm. Into the realm. invisible realm. Yeah, okay, no, totally. It's the, whatever Paul is talking about in Ephesians, where he talks about the heavenly places, that's yeah. what he's talking about. Yeah, perfect. No, I'm with that. I'm with that. And um, yeah, I keep forgetting about that middle realm. You know, the I got, the I got so confused that. by that because I was but there really is something that I'm thinking about went... now that's really messed that whole. I remember it through Jesus passed space. through the heavens. 
Yeah. Well, that even makes it, I like the fact that that, that accounts for his ascension, you know, basically because then he's going to the second heaven, but he passes know, the through the first heaven sky, passes yes. through the second heavens, the principality power arm, and he enters into the third heavens. And what I love about that is if you turn the tabernacle, you know, and it's designed vertically and you've got the high priest, I mean, it's really happening just like that. He's passing through all those symbolic elements, getting to that veil, the cloudy veil, uh, which is, you know, with the candles burning before the veil and then entering into God's throne room. So yeah. I suppose, you know, what, what, what I wanted to distinguish though is that there is even in the invisible realm, a difference between God's court, as you say, yes. you know, and, and, God's and, presence. and, and so, then the yeah. place that is invisible, you know? So it feels like there needs to be a second heaven, third heaven thing. But I don't even there. know if heaven would be a good way to describe that, because I think in that sense, you're talking about a place that no mortal it's, it's a place that's not a place because it's, it's not yeah it's not a place it's a place yet, that's it's not outside a place. of time it's outside right. of space it's not a time. but okay so forgetting that now and thinking yeah. now more about you know the place uh i mean when we're talking about the place that satan has been cast out from are we right. talking there about an invisible realm or are we talking about uh heaven you know the third heavens the invisible the realm. Heavens. yeah cast from the third heavens down to to space uh, no well, to no, make it the first heavens to, not, prince of the power no. of the air because that the air would be part of the first heavens okay hang on, hang on, hang on. yeah okay. see, so we got two things take, going on here yeah no Can take a climbing paradigm yeah yeah first, so the the thing i'm operating on first heaven sky yeah. second mm -hmm. heaven space third heaven supernatural realm yeah okay that's that's I think that if you look any bible dictionary that's what that's what yeah, you get sure. if got you're it. talking yeah. about third heaven okay so um so another way of thinking about that, if the third heaven thing is throwing you, is you just think about clients or, or, or the standard Bible, um, visible and invisible. Yes. And the first two heavens are just talking about the visible realm. Right. The third heaven is talking about the invisible realm. Got it. Yeah. So that's good. Okay. Now, now. So, so when you're talking about Satan being cast down, yes, that's not really the framework because he's not being cast from invisible to visible. No. So that's a mistake I made earlier. He's, he's still in the invisible realm. Yes. Uh, but he's just outside of uh, out, outside of God's throne room. Okay. He's outside of Eden. All right. So we're not even talking about the three heaven structure yet. No, I, I'm not when you're talking about the cast down thing. Okay. I think that's, well, the that's what we're getting. I mean, the principalities and powers are associated with the second heavens. Though. They're associated with the third heavens, not the second heavens. Are they? Okay. The heavenly places. That's fine. We we don't need to ramble about this, but uh, yeah, that, that's my recall as I understand. So the heavenly the heavenly places are the places where we are raised and seated with Christ. It's also the places where the spiritual warfare takes place. So that whole realm, the heavenly places, just referring to that super that invisible creation, that supernatural realm. Okay. Good. I I feel like I have a million questions. <laughs> Yeah, seated with Christ ask... at the right hand of the Father is not the second realm. It's the third. No, it's the third. It's the third realm. You said second. Like, anyway. No, I, I'm not talking. The second is just space, guys. <laughs> That's it's just stars and planets. Okay, but, sorry. You said the invisible realm. Yeah, but but, but then the... you're saying the invisible realm has got two parts. There's basically the lower part for Satan and the upper part, the the, the throne room of God. No, well, I'm not making that distinction. Maybe, but I'm I, I'm just saying that that realm. I would like need a, to make that distinction. <laughs> well, maybe, but, but it's a little bit like in Sheol, you know, it, it's it's an invisible realm, but it's a realm where everyone goes, you know, prior to the ascension of Christ. Mm. Oh, uh, hang on, it, it, hang on. It's it, it's a it, it's a place where everyone, whether you're, you know, Lazarus. But do you believe or, that Jesus descended into hell, uh, Andre? Yeah, well, I do. Yeah. <laughs> so this is this is this is getting tied up like a. <laughs> But no, but just to stay focused. How on the can issue, we bring this back so I can at least put something on? Uh, what are you going to label internet? this as? Well, you did well last week, I think. But uh, no, just call well, it "Making the Invisible Realms Visible" with Andre, Nick, and Mike. But the, the <laughs> making your the point clarity I'm to make, go away with Andre, Mike, and Nick. <laughs> the point I'm trying to make is that when we're talking about Satan's fall, we're not talking about a fall from one level of the heavens to another. That's not what's going on there. 
No, so his no. cast down to earth cast down is like a, not a, that he dropped a, a level, a deep it's not like elevator action, yeah, it's a, and he went down one layer. It's it's that he was cast out of God's presence in in that Edenic sense. Yes, so he no longer operates yeah. as a throne guardian. Right, right. Okay. I'm happy yeah. with that. I think that's okay. Yeah, I think. And and, <laughs> and 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 there will be ramifications for where he can and can't work in terms of bringing about his influence. And so descriptions like Prince of the Power of the Air are describing those aspects because even in the even in the when you get to the second heavens stars and planets yeah right there's a lot of overlap with the spiritual realm there in terms of symbolism yeah so stars, I totally because the angels, whole thing it's almost like, like it's, that's what it was there for it was yeah. it was there to show us heaven uh in a symbolic form and and so it's almost like yeah if you i just think about those um you know like when um when the ark is designed, it's designed with those three layers, the tabernacle has got the three three divisions, and the whole thing is like pulling together the the entire cosmos. And the cosmos, in some sense, is everything that's visible, not the invisible, you know, in terms of man's domain and whatnot. But but that final upper register kind of layer, I suppose, is 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 meant to be united to it. So it's like we're thinking in an unnatural way, almost in light of the final eschatology of of the whole thing. Um, but yeah, that's that's like a big subject, and it's you know you need. Yeah, maybe not every three layered thing is describing the same thing. Yeah, so maybe John Frame's triperspectivalism could help right now. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, and maybe not. It's possible. <laughs> maybe in each one of those things, there are three perspectives. There's a, there's a tr yeah multi perspectival. But what oh, is yeah, true. the triperspectival view of triperspectivalism? <laughs> Ooh. Hmm. what is that it's like a mirror <laughs> well from the ethical that perspective, looks into a mirror <laughs> <laughs> that looks into <laughs> yeah it's like the promenades of euclid oh okay all right should we let's just try and wrap up um, i got a thesis to write let's try and wrap up and let's say what what you know if someone had been listening to everything we've been talking about now after the edits um what what is it that they need to take away from this whole thing uh let's let's try and give a two minute wrap up from each one of us starting with you nick i think what we've looked at today is something of a theology of satan okay uh, we've looked at the origin story of satan <clears throat> yeah. we've looked at uh, the nature of the temptation and the whole who is the serpent and what is the serpent Mm -hmm. um, and I think what we've done is we've we've tried to show uh, a marriage between traditional hermeneutics and yet also employing some of the best of the insights of ancient Near Eastern stuff and grammatical historical approaches to scripture. Mm -hmm. And we're finding that uh, the Christian church continues to hold uh, to the same view of Satan that it has always held to, despite some of the new insights and enriching of some of our perspectives. Mm -hmm. Good. You, Andrew? Yeah, I think that's right. I absolutely agree with all that. I, I just think um, it's also about just continuing to, to read the Bible canonically. So you're allowing the whole of the canon to continue to shape your understanding and, and reading of certain texts. And you're just also allowing the sufficiency of, of Scripture that uh, it, you know rather than assume there is some extra biblical event uh, that that uh, is filling in some of the, the gaps rather is there a way in which genesis uh, the early chapters of genesis are are helping us to understand about the origin of evil and the fall of satan so just rethinking whether or not actually it's best to understand or genesis is actually wanting us to see in genesis 3 the fall of satan and the origin of evil and connecting that to the creation of mankind as being the the catalyst for Satan's jealousy and his revolt against God because of his jealousy over humanity made in the image. Um, and, uh, and connecting that to other pieces of puzzle, like why Adam and Eve were so taken in by the serpent creature, as well as allowing ancient Near Eastern insights to, to understand why, why the imagery of a serpent is so important and so fitting for the garden throne room of Eden. Good. Um, okay, well, let me just throw in just two little angles 
um, just in terms of people listening, uh, you know, because what we want to try and do in this podcast is really just more and more do less and less editing for me, more and more just raw. Hey, we're talking and, you know, tune in if you want to tune out if you don't. Um, but at the same time, we're all pastors and we want to be responsible and we know that, you know, you we want to be a little bit different to those Bible scholars out there that just kind of throw you with these awesome bits and then leave you leave you for dead if you can't figure it out. So I suppose what what I want to say here is just in this podcast, everything that we've been talking about, uh, for me, there's a positive and a negative. Uh, the positive is that it's it's really it's it is interesting and it's our Bible and we do need to think about it. And, you know, there's it's almost uh, recently uh, Eric Orton put out something you know, he's an Old Testament Hebrew guy. And, and he said, you know, one of the things I'm just resolved to do is stay, keep myself interested in the Hebrew Bible or in the Old Testament. He's an Old Testament guy. And, uh, and it just resonated with me because it is such an exciting, interesting, you know, uh, infinitely mysterious uh, book. And I think sometimes we can think that we've got it in the bag and we can think that, you know, because we've got read out, you know, King James only study Bible that we've, you know, we've totally pinned everything down and we lose some of the mystery and excitement that can come with, with Old Testament study that should be there and really biblical study because all half of the stuff is tying in to, to what Paul's saying and what Jesus did and so forth. So, you know, the, I think one of the things is that you have to just allow yourself some room to explore and, and look at and ask questions and so forth. And it's really a real shame when that can't happen. Um, on the other side, of course, there's always the danger that we get overly speculative and we, uh, you know, end up focusing in the wrong area and just just basically, um, in, you know, whether it be overly literal, or overly, you know, symbolic, uh, e either way or overly speculative, uh, e all of those ways have real dangers associated to them. And I think we are warned against that as well in scripture. I think Augustine said, uh, you know, someone asked him, um, uh, what is hell? <laughs> and he said, it's a place made for those who are curious. <laughs> Or, or, or those who are overly uh, who ask too many questions or something like that. Obviously, he yeah. put it better than I did. But but it's kind of that whole idea. Curiosity killed the cat. And you have to be careful with that. Um, when, when you approach the Bible, it's sacred. There is a labyrinth there and you can't, you know, there's a limit to what you know. So you have to, the secret things belong to God and you got to be content with that because you can't derail your life in thinking about really obscure things that you'll never know the answer to. And it can take your focus away from Christ. So with those two little things in place, I would like to let this run and uh, and just, you know, join us in a conversation where we're just thinking about these things and, um, and you know, hopefully, you know, we'll, we'll grow and we'll t change our understanding as we do, but within the safety of a, of a confessional framework and Christian orthodoxy. All right. So with that in place. Sayonara. Sayonara.